jazzy music off of a royalty-free uh, sketchy website we found somewhere. It can only mean one thing. It is the Florida Man and Friends podcast. I'm Rob Cassidy. I'm joined again by Dan McDonald, uh, another national analyst at Rivals.com, who is in the wonderful Lakewood Rec Complex. It's is my big, huge gym behind me. It's amazing. The, the optics are great. It sounds, it sounds great in there. Uh, what do you do all day in there when there's no events? Take us through a day of, of Dan on the job whole bunch of court rentals and getting ready for another busy travel season at Lake Point. So it's, hope, uh, hope there's another busy travel season. Yeah, there. let's hope, right? It's strange. People that haven't been there, it's like they built a city around that thing, right? Like there's like fast food. It's like that they popped up this giant gymnasium in the middle of nowhere in Georgia and then yeah. built around it like it's Disney World, right? Like it, Well, actually, so the baseball fields were actually out there first and yeah. then there were some soccer lacrosse fields and then they started with the hotels, Chick-fil-A, Arby's, Wendy's, <laughs> gas stations. And In Great there's some weird, You didn't even get to see North Campus, Rob. Wait until you see North Campus open up here hopefully next year. So. What's going on over there? There'll be more, uh, I think they're building 13 more soccer lacrosse fields and baseball fields and more just, you know, hotels and entertainment kind of stuff. And one of the most Georgia there. things ever, it's like they pop this thing up and then they realize, oh, a bunch of people are coming out here. We better build a Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get the Chick-fil-A. The only, thing, the only thing we're missing is that Waffle House. Yeah, no, that's that, that's probably next though. All right, oh, sure. enough of Lake Point. Let's get into this. Uh, I guess we'll talk some. We'll talk about the season coming up. We can talk about what happened with Greg Marshall and then kind of that stuff. But let's first, since this is technically a recruiting podcast, I guess we should stay on topic and talk recruiting. We had three commitments since the last time you and I spoke here. Uh, Ty Ty Washington made his decision to go to Creighton over Illinois. We had Cam McDowell commit to Georgia yesterday, I believe, one that you were all over. Uh, and then the big one is obviously Roosevelt Wheeler picking Louisville. Uh, let's talk about Roosevelt a little bit because he is the highest ranked kid. I think that's probably the most national newsworthy commitment. I'm impressed with the kid. I've not seen him live. I've seen the tape, a lot of it, <laughs> in the last few days. And as a fellow broad shoulder dude myself, I, <laughs> you know, I can relate to a guy that can kind of get under the basket, bang, you know, he's not going to blow you away with finesse. This isn't a dude that's going to pull up with jump shots or be playing out on the perimeter. Uh, he's kind of a throwback where he stands underneath there, bangs around, gets rebounds, gets sloppy putbacks, uh, and really just kind of controls the glass. I, I think that's kind of what I see, and I think that's what Louisville's getting, and I think they're going to love it. Yeah, no, I can't disagree more. And I think it's just another example of the, of the impressive quality that Chris uh, Chris Mack can bring into Louisville. I mean, he's – He's done an unbelievable job. I mean, this goes back to when he was at Xavier. He was an unbelievable recruiter, but they just continue to stack talent there in Louisville. Now, he's a personable guy, too, right? He's a guy that you see interact with. And he's a bald guy. Let's, yeah, let's see, not, let's not uh, discredit that either. <laughs> you, know, team, you know, score one for team bald for sure. We, right, we, right. He's a guy that gets along with everyone, though. You know, you see him at events or you see him out, and he's not somebody that really stays to himself. He's, he's talking to the media. He's joking with anybody standing around. You know, you kind of get an everyman. Uh, vibe from him, I think. And I think that's why players kind of like him. Uh, he's really easy to talk to, no matter what your background is, I think. And, you know, I think that's kind of come across in the recruiting he's done, even at Xavier, as you said, and now at Louisville. Uh, and, you know, there's not too much more to say about Wheel other than, you know, it's nice to kind of see a big man bang like that these days, and everybody kind of wants to float at the perimeter and shoot jump shots. Uh, Wheeler's not going to do that. He's a bully, and I appreciate a bully if anybody does. And, and, and I mean, a lot of schools are going to these lineups where it's basically just four guards. And if you can get a big man like that in the middle of the paint just to kind of take up space and protect the rim, like those are hard to find these days, like you said. So that's a, that's a big get for Louisville. The other big one uh, is Ty Ty Washington, who kind of served me a helping of Crow. I thought he was going to Illinois pretty much the entire time until right before the decision where I kind of got word that, that he, it was going the other way. Sometimes following the visits can get you into trouble. <laughs> I think it got me into trouble. My line of thinking was as followed. He took a late visit that he paid for to go to Illinois, and it really seemed like to me that it was a, let me see this place before I commit to it type trip. What I didn't take into account enough was that Greg McDermott had built that relationship with him. I mean, they were the second school to offer. Uh, and, you know, they, they're right there in the backyard. I guess that trip to Champaign wasn't enough to overcome the bond that they had built there. Uh, maybe I underestimated the strength of that bond, but it's a testament to Greg McDermott to be able to wrestle somebody away from Illinois. I mean, usually when, when, when you're a team like that, and Creighton's a fine program, obviously, with great history, but when Illinois comes knocking late and the, the kid goes and visits, I'd say seven out of ten times you can ring the bell, right? Yeah, no, but right under was that, that happen, and there's something to be said for that. Yeah, he's, they've done a great job there. I, I personally, and you're close to this one, and I was. You probably a little closer than I did, but 
if I had to guess, like if I was Ty Ty, being a point guard in that offense, playing where you're probably going to have a bunch of shooters around you, he's going to have a bunch of space to operate and do what he does as a floor general. I, I think that's a really, really smart decision by him. I think he'll flourish there in Douglas Thurman. That's a, that's a, that's a big time fit, I think. Yeah, it's a big time kid and a kid that really came on late, right? Like this is a kid that this summer in the limited events that he played really kind of helped the stock. We moved him way up the rankings. Uh, did you have a chance to see him or, or was that mainly Boston Ford? I believe I saw him last summer was the last time I saw him. So we're talking about 16 months ago. Okay. But um, yeah, I mean, everybody I've talked to lately that's seen him said the same thing that he kind of played his butt off in recent events and um, really kind of seems like he's got it all together right now. Yeah, like you mentioned, he is kind of a floor general, but he became more of a scorer this summer is what, what it looks like when you read is that, you know, he really kind of asserted himself a little bit more. Maybe the confidence started flowing. Uh, and I think you and I, I mean, we have him ranked high for a reason. You and I both think that they're getting a nice player there. Great. Now, the third, the third commitment that we need to speak about is one that I don't know anything about. I've not ever seen Cam McDowell, who Georgia picked up yesterday. Uh, kind of wasn't on my radar at all. Tell us about him and kind of what UGA is getting. Yeah, so he, that one kind of came out of nowhere for me, too. I knew George was involved with him. I just kind of assumed that Cam was going to play out his senior year and kind of see what his options were. But um, now I've been watching him, him since he was a freshman, and he's about a 6'3", 6'4", combo guard, really athletic, strong, tough kid, just a, just a relentless competitor, man. Like he'll, He's a lockdown defender. He's trying to dunk on guys every time he goes to the rim. Um, I would think if you were kind of talking about him maybe six months ago, the question would have been, like, can he shoot it at a level? that can allow him to play in the ACC or the SEC. And I think over the summer and even this fall when I saw him a little bit, like he started shooting it a lot better, a lot more consistently. And I think that, you know, along with, you know, maybe missing on some guys, I, th I think that kind of led Georgia, like, you know, we need to go ahead and lock this guy up. We can't take the chance that, you know, other schools in our league are going to come try to steal this guy away from us. Like Missouri was coming on late. Uh, LSU was involved. I believe TCU and Virginia Tech. So his recruitment was starting to pick up here, but – um I think Georgia's smart. I think he's going to be a good player for them. They did. And as you mentioned, they did miss on some guys, but they set their sights extremely high. You know, yeah, I don't think, honestly, I don't think they were, they didn't really put their eggs in a lot of um, baskets this year. I think, I mean, Jabari Smith was one they think they wanted. And, you know, Matthew Cleveland went to Florida State, Deshaun Holt, you know, maybe Kwesi Reeves a little bit too. But there wasn't a ton of guys in state. I mean, they're still involved with Aminu Muhammad, but I don't know if they'd be able to get him in mid year just because of the scholarship situation. And, you know, Michael Foster is another guy they've been in on, but, you know, I think everybody kind of thinks he's going G League. So, you know, I well, mean, this and then this year too, like a lot of schools are going to be looking at transfers to see if, what the transfer portal looks like in April. And, you know, you, if you have seniors this year, you can bring those guys back. So you don't even really have to recruit this year if you don't want to. So there's just so many variables at play that, you know. And they should get a boost tonight, right? Like by the time anybody hears this, the draft will be over. Edwards will be in the NBA. We don't know where. We assume he'll be the first pick, we think, maybe. <laughs> but I, I mean, I mean, I guess it could be ball as well. How much of a boost is that? I mean, everybody knows that he's obviously it has known and his prospect knows that he's an NBA level lottery number, maybe possible number one pick that player, but to actually see him, I guess, virtually walk across the stage tonight. George has got to capitalize on that momentum. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I'll say this, like when you talk to kids locally around here, it doesn't even have to be an Atlanta kid. Like you can be kids from just all over. When you ask them about Georgia, usually the first thing that comes up, oh, yeah, I watched Georgia. They had, they had Ant-Man this year. So I think it's already starting to help. It's just I think the big thing for them now is to hoping that Ant goes to a situation that's good for him and he kind of blossoms to the next level. Because if he's kind of just one of these guys that's just an okay player, you know, two, three years from now, it just doesn't really matter. Where if he really pops and can get this thing going, that is something that he can kind of point back to like he did with Oladipo and D-Wade. And that's kind of – I mean, really, that, that, that's kind of the legacy of how they got Ant to Athens, right? Like – is he grew up idolizing those two guys, knew that Crean coached them, and followed the, followed Crean. Uh, so if you can capitalize on that and it becomes the next generation of players watching Ant, they can really get something special started there. And I think this really hinges on what happens next, right? Like he's got to go to a good situation. The more he thrives, the better it is. And <laughs> I'd be real, real excited if I was a Georgia fan right now for the future. Yeah, I mean, I would say this, too. The good thing for Georgia with Ant is that, he, like, in probably the last you – know, I've been doing this recruiting stuff for about 11 years now. In that time, like, Ant's one of the guys in Atlanta who just kind of pops with other kids. Like, he's a big deal here in Atlanta area. So, he just – everything about him, like, everybody knows who he is. Everybody likes him. Like, he's got a big personality. So, he, he's the right kind of superstar to have. 
you know, kind of represent your program. All right, I guess we should move off the draft unless you have something else to uh, – I mean, we do have a college basketball season starting. <laughs> right around the corner, a week away. It's crazy how, how, how fast and furious the news has come this year. You know, you have the draft, we had the early signing period, and now we have a Thanksgiving start of a college basketball season that we don't really know if it's going to finish or how it's going to finish. I, I can bet look, you it finishes. These, these schools are going to need that NCAA tournament money. So okay, they're, they're going to finish it somehow. But it's going to be a lot of twists and turns to get there for sure. I think it will finish. Do you see a situation where we're sitting down and the this, this selection committee is looking at some schools that have played 15 games and other ones that have played 30 and trying to, <laughs> trying to, make, trying to make heads or tails of who to put in? That's going to yeah, be a it's, it's possible. I, I would say this. The one thing that basketball has going in its favor that football doesn't is that football, like if you cancel a game this Saturday, you can't go make that game up Wednesday and then play again Saturday because it's just not physically possible. Whereas basketball, I mean, if we had to get to extremes, like where you had to play literally a whole week every night you're playing the game, it's not ideal, but it's possible. Because you could, you could technically – I mean, these teams do it. They, in a conference tournament situation, you're playing four, maybe even five day, games in five days. So – you can kind of schedule on the fly a little bit easier. You can make up games a little bit easier. So I think we'll be a situation where there's going to be teams that don't play the full 25 for sure. But I would be willing to bet that most teams will probably be at least at 20 unless they're in a league where they're not allowing uh, non-conference games. But like I said, it's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of twists and turns. I would love to see a grassroots situation where we just pile 13 teams into an LA for a giant, or maybe it's hey, like, I got a place right behind you. We can host that bad boy. Well, I mean, they haven't played four games, a day, four games a day until this thing's over all right let's talk about it we'll get into a little bet that we've made off the air eventually right now let's talk big picture let's put each other on the spot here who is going to win the national championship dan mcdonald you know what i really think if you were going to really push me to this i thought baylor was going to do it last year i love the guards they had i think scott drew's kind of got to figure it figured out with his you know the zones and everything he mixes up there I thought they were going to do it last year. And I think when you take away that opportunity from a team to go cut down the nets, that they really – they would have been a one seed and they would have had a chance to do it right here in Atlanta. I think they're going to come back hungry as heck. And I think they're going to do it this year. I think they're cutting down the nets in April. I like Gonzaga. I think – you want to talk about getting over the hump. They've gotten over the recruiting hump. They've got Suggs in there now. He's their highest ranked recruit ever. They've gotten right to the doorstep. And – I think this is the year. I think that I don't want to say it's the most talented team, but it's a good mix of talent and experience. I think they they've now had some some experience, kind of being the favorite. Because you know, say what you want, but even for Mark Few, it's been a decade long odyssey of going from nobody to plucky underdog to oh, this is a really cute story to this is a juggernaut, and they haven't really been a juggernaut for that long. And I think this is the year where they kind of embrace that role of of favorite and i think they do it i think this is going to be it i think we're going to see a lot out of Suggs. i i i love them that's my pick i, I can support that i thought about going way off the page and just picking somebody insane uh, which i wish i did it, for our bet if there was ever a year that was going to happen this would be it yeah wouldn't it be nice to see like some crazy mid major do it oh, not yeah, gonzaga I mean... <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't even – Gonzaga, does, does they even count as a mid-major anymore? No, that's what I'm saying. I mean, when, when did we stop counting them as a mid-major? Five years ago, probably? I would just say whenever you officially become a number one seed in the NCAA tournament, you're probably not a mid-major anymore. So whenever the first year they were a number one seed, that's when I kind of scratched them off. All right, who are you looking forward to seeing? Let's talk freshman class of 2020. Who is your guy that you're going to – must be TV this year? I don't know if he's must-see TV, but I think the guy that we're going to look back at and think, like, why wasn't that guy ranked higher? And I kind of, this is the guy I kind of fought with Corey and Bossy before they both left on rankings. So I can kind of blame this all on them when he's really good. good. <laughs> you like blaming them. Although but, uh, no, I think the guy that I always really, really liked, I think, more than them was Isaiah Jackson and if, at Kentucky. And if, if you kind of followed some of the preseason talk out of uh, Kentucky's practices and everything, I think they had a combine here recently. He's been getting rave reviews about just how active he is, how hard he plays, how athletic he is, his finishing ability. You know, he may not go average 18 points a game. I bet he doesn't average 18 points a game. But I think there's going to be games where, you know, maybe he has 14 points, 12 rebounds, and five or six blocks. And you leave that game thinking he's the most impactful player on the court. I, I think that's certainly possible. And I, and I think show up there to see Boston and maybe. 
Yeah, no, and I think like from an NBA standpoint, like he's, I think he could be a guy that really right, like this night next year, I guess I know it's not going to be November for the draft, but um, when draft comes around for these, this next set of guys, I think he'll be somebody that could pick a little higher than we probably think today. What about you? Who you got? Who are you looking forward to seeing? My guy, I'm going to go a little bit off the page, is, is McCurr Maker. Just because, you know, for everybody that's always wondered what it's going to look like to see a five-star on, a, on, a, on Howard, uh, I think the story is cool with him going to HBCU. I think there's a chance that he could just be incredibly dominant there. You know, we had Kenny Blakeney on this podcast a couple of weeks ago, and he sat here and looked me in my eyes and told me that they're going to use him at point guard some, which I cannot wait to see. You know, I, I'd like to tune in to see things I've never seen before. And I think there's going to be a lot of firsts at Howard with that kid there. Uh, they won four games last year. They were terrible. Blakeney will tell you that to your face. This is going to be a change team. Will they make the NCAA tournament? I don't know. But, you know, he's the type of kid that could will them there, I think, or at least will them to yeah. emerge. And even if he doesn't, I think it's going to be fun to watch him just kind of dominate that league. Yeah, you know, and I got a one that got away here. And um, the one I was – if you would asked me this before he decided to go to the G League, I was so excited to see what Dacian Nix could have done at UCLA. I, I really, truly believe that that could have been Lonzo Ball all over again, and he could have just elevated all the guys around him. I was so excited to see him play there. and. Yeah. Anyway, I was everybody's got to do what's best for their family, but man, I, I hate that we don't see him in college basketball. Should we let's touch on the let's touch on the coaching change stuff because I think it's the timing of it's really interesting. We don't have to dive into the, the, the causes behind it or anything like that. That's been done ad nauseum. But Wichita State loses Greg Marshall, who is the greatest coach in program history, now, uh, a week before the season is set to start. The roster is in shambles. <laughs> Maybe we could talk big picture here it could be devastating for recruiting, right? Like I could see this being a multi, I mean, it's going to be a multi-year deal there at Wichita State, no matter who they hire, unless they find some splash to come in there. I, <laughs> this is going to be a five-year rebuild, in my opinion. You look at that roster, and it's just Juco transfer after Juco transfer after Juco transfer because they had to plug all those holes up. They have one commitment on the list. He's not signed. I wouldn't sign there with no coach if I were him. I, I just, you know, him and then the Penn State situation too, do you kind of see this any logical way that this could be an easy fix at any one of these places? Or are we talking long-term rebuilds here? Fight me on both of you, all your points, actually. Um, <laughs> so I, I have good news if you're a Wichita State fan or a Penn State fan. And I think there's some similarities in both situations. The thing that's going to make these rebuilds go a lot quicker at all these schools is this new transfer rule, where if you've got eight uh, scholarships going into April, you can go get – four or five transfers, get two or three high school kids, maybe find a JUCO or you know, international guy, and you can plug in your roster and you know have a pretty talented group. Question is, now you got to look at finding a coach that's not one of these guys that's kind of old school who wants to kind of build a program. Like the sport's gone away from building with three and four year guys and okay, just do the best you can with the roster that's been given to you for that year. And you know, we've seen Calipari be able to do that. We've seen Chris Beard be able to do that at Texas Tech, you know, no one jumps out. Um, Eric Musselman has done a good job of doing this. There's, there's a bunch of them around the country who've kind of, you know, adapted to this. So I think that, and then Wichita State, people may not know this, they have a lot of money there. They were paying Greg Marshall $3 million. They do have a lot of money. And Charles Koch back. Penn State's got the Big Ten money coming in. And I know COVID's kind of affected a lot of schools, but these are two schools that can pay to go out and get a good coach. Now, can they convince this coach to come in given the circumstance of what's going on? That might be tough, but – I always believe there's good coaches out there to find. And if you have the money and now you have the ability to go out and get players right away, these, I think Penn State's just a tough job in general, but I don't think these are, you know, five-year rebuilds. Like if you go out and hire the right guy, you could be looking at, you know, even next year being pretty competitive. And the year after that, you got a pretty good base to your program being built. I agree with the money part, especially with Wichita State. You know, Charles Koch is one of the richest men in the world. Uh, yes. He runs Koch Industries, is Wichita State's biggest booster. They have a nice arena. The issue is bringing somebody into Wichita State and I've got the roster here. The newcomers, you've got Craig Porter, junior college transfer. Uh, you've got a UConn transfer in the Gilbert kid. Ricky Camp, Council, freshman, freshman, freshman. Three more JUCO transfers. It's going to be really hard to sell any coach with, with any kind of proven track record. Okay, here's your roster. And, and, and convince him that he's not set up to fail. <laughs> I mean, you're going to have to give this guy a long time. To, to, to yeah, I mean, if it's going it's to probably take a, a five-year deal, and you know, you're you going to have to look at probably paying a guy a couple million bucks a year. I know it took a while for Greg Marshall to get there, but 
there, there's always guys. I mean, there's guys from coast to coast that would love the opportunity to go coach at a place like Wichita State. Very yeah, they get great facilities. And like you said, the money's there. And if you do well yeah, there, it's been proven that they will retain you. you know? And I'll say this, too. Like, I think, you know, when you start looking at jobs, like if we're ranking the best jobs in the AAC, which I know Wichita State and AAC is not the same as when it's in the Missouri Valley, where it's by far the best job. But, you know, it's, it's maybe not the same job as Houston or Memphis or Cincinnati, but it's pretty close to where you're going to – if you get the right guy in there, you're going to have a chance to win that league. I've been to a game there. It's a great atmosphere. Oh, I believe it. It, it looks like – Yeah, it truly is. It's a, it's a fun place to see a game. What else do we got today, Dan? I'm looking over here. You got anything else you want to touch on, or should we move into uh, our gambling? I want, I want to get the gambling stuff out of the way here. I didn't hear you. I, I want to get this – I want to make these gambling picks. Let's, right, so let's, 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 do make, let's do the picks. So let's tell the people – what we've come to here is that we've decided on a wager where we're going to try to attempt to pick as many elite eight teams as we can pick before a game is played, <laughs> which we're, one of us is probably going to go two and oh, and that's going to win it. Right. And the stakes are, if I win your Twitter avatar becomes a Mets logo. You noted Braves fan, right? This, this is rough on me, Rob. Uh, but yeah, I'm in, I'm in on it. <laughs> okay. And it'll happen for a month. Your, your Twitter logo will become a Mets logo for a month, preferably the one right behind me. Okay. Um, I'll find a version of that. Or okay. we can give you this Mike Piazza bobble. But one of the two. We'll put something on there. And then if you win, which you will not, I will do whatever you want me to do as far as Twitter. Go with the Buffalo Bills. That's well, right. You know, see, that would be too painful for me because I kind of like the Bills. I, I'm not a Bills fan, but I do enjoy watching them. They're a fun team to watch. How did you become a Bills fan, by the way? I am from Buffalo. Family's up there, so oh. that's that's my that's been my team since birth. It's my ride or die. The okay. only team where I just every get, every game I live and die with them. We get a sidetrack this time. You've been to games there, then, right or no? I've been to two regular season games and a handful of preseason games. I was is young. it as insane as people like you see like the people on the burning tables and yes, some of the other uh, stuff. It's basically SEC football in the Northeast. That's probably the, with the weather kind of factored in so if, if you can kind of picture that, that that's a by the best you know picture i can paint so it's a lot of people drinking like cinnamon whiskey and jumping through burning tables yeah all of that no that's bucket list item for me i would love to go maybe we could go together i don't my friends and i always joke about going uh maybe or that's what i can do there. oh for the parking lot or something <laughs> yeah. i'll tell you what if we do do that I'll happily jump through a table off of what a big. Okay, I'm holding you to that. As, as somebody who did a lot of backyard wrestling as a child, I, I, could, <laughs> I, I, could, I could be down with that. I will do it. it. And we can video and put on the podcast. All right. Do you want to go first with your, with your Elite Eight picks? Or do you want to alternate? We can, let, let's alternate. So I've got the top 25 in front of me. And I know I just took Baylor as my national champion pick. I'm going to copy. I'm going to kind of piggyback off of you. I'm going to take uh, Gonzaga as my second pick. Okay, so you've got Baylor and Gonzaga. I also have Baylor and Gonzaga. I explained that I like Sug, so we're on the same page there. I will, I'll throw us off here because where I went way off, I took one that was kind of way off the – because, you know, there's always going to be a mid-major hanging around. Absolutely. I think Northern Iowa's going to make it. I mean, this is a team that went 25-6 and six a year ago. They've got their leading scorer back. They didn't lose all that much. I, you know, when you look at the field of mid-majors, I can. I, I think it's them, and I'm going to take Northern Iowa. That's that, that's that's the Rob special mid-major pick. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll kind of piggyback off you again. I'm not going to go to Northern Iowa, but I'm just going to stay in the same state, and I'm going to go with Iowa. I think Luca Garza being back is a huge, huge deal. He'll be one of the best players in the country. I think Iowa's got elite eight uh, potential to him. I took Florida State uh, because I've spoken with some coaches there who seem really high on that group, and I know that. Every coach thinks their team is awesome. Uh, but the one in question here I think would tell me if he was down on them. And, you know, he thinks it's a special group. I think they're a little underrated. I think Scotty Barnes is going to be phenomenal. I think he's going to come in there. He's going to make a difference right away. I'll take Florida State to make it. I'm going to go with, uh, I think, Rick Barnes. I think Tennessee is going to make the make an Elite Eight run. I think they got some newcomers. I love Jaden Springer. I think he kind of brings a – the, the kind of nastiness and toughness that you need to play for Rick Barnes. I think he's going to, and Keon Johnson's a lot of the same. They got uh, Vescovi's back. They got Ives Pond's back. They got a lot of talent this year. I think they're going to win the SEC, and I think they're going to make the Elite Eight. I also have Tennessee on my list, uh, so we'll put them there. So right now we've got Dan with Tennessee, Gonzaga, Baylor, Iowa. 
and then I've got Tennessee, Zaga, Baylor, Northern Iowa. Hopefully we, we – oh, I've got Florida State. Am I missing one for you? Uh, well, you can go ahead and add Florida State to my list. i got Florida State in mind as well. See, we're going to have to have a tiebreaker or something here. Yeah. All right. Well, well yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll figure this out. And I don't think what we told everybody, too, is we decided that in January, in the first podcast we do, we each get one amendment. So. Yeah, and I think that's fair for this season because, you know, you don't want to take a team off that's played nine games or, <laughs> you know, and is, and is five and three or sort of three and five or something. Okay. All right, so your turn and my turn. So – I've got two more then, right? Um, and I think, yeah, you go ahead. And hopefully I don't have them or else we're going to have to redo this or something. Yeah, we'll have a problem. So, I, uh, you know, looking at the top 25 here, you know, we had we just talked about the tie-tie battle between Illinois and Creighton. Okay. Creighton won that one. I'm going to take Illinois here with A.O. Dosanu and okay. Kofi Coburn back. They're going to make the Elite Eight. I think Brad Underwood's an amazing coach. They're going to make the Elite Eight this year. Not to spoil anything, but next week, Brad Underwood will be on this very podcast. Awesome. Uh, tell, him, tell him about the pick. I will. I'll let him know. I do not have Illinois, so that's, that, that's a different one. I have Virginia. Uh, I, I like the defense. I think this, this smells like a bounce back year. You know, they got the Marquette transfer in there, Sam Hauser. I think he's going to make a difference. They've got some dudes. You know they're going to defend. Hauser's going to have to do some heavy lifting, but I think there's a culture there and a culture of defense that, that's going to will them into the Elite Eight. Once you get them in a tournament situation – uh, and I also think, like if you said, I think they're the kind of team kind of built for this weird season, right? They don't have to rely on, you know, somebody getting in a rhythm and the shooting stroke. They can kind of rely on the way that they play and the culture and the defense. And I think that'll will them into the Elite Eight. I will take UVA to make it. I'm, uh, I'm going to go back to the SEC with my next pick. And uh, I'm going to take Kentucky. I, wow. I trust this Kentucky team. I think they've got a lot of weapons. Like you mentioned, we talked about Isaiah Jackson, but B.J. Boston. Um, they got some transfer coming in. I, I just trust Calipari. I'm a big John Calipari guy. Um, I think this is probably not his most talented group, but I like the way the pieces on this roster fit together more than most of his teams. And uh, I think I think ten, or Kentucky's going to make another run. I have them as well, uh, just because, like you said, Boston. I think, And then I think the most obvious pick is my last pick, and that's Villanova with Con Gillespie, who's coming back, who I loved, who had a great year uh, the last time we saw him. I think they're going to be good. I think that this is the easiest pick. I think that this is the gimme. I think there's a chance that they can win the national championship. If I'm not going to pick Baylor, I'm going to pick Villanova and Jay Wright. I, you know, I, that, that's my last pick. Please tell me we're different on that one. Okay, so yeah, I, let me go through this. So I had Baylor, Gonzaga, Iowa, Kentucky, Illinois. That's five. Tennessee is six, correct? And Florida State seven. So those are my seven right now, okay, right? Tennessee, Florida State, Iowa, Baylor, Zaga. Tennessee, Illinois, Kentucky. That's eight for you, right? Tennessee, Florida State, Iowa, Baylor, Gonzaga. Oh, I had Tennessee twice for you. So, yeah, you have one more. Okay. So, I'm, I'm, you went off the radar with your Northern Iowa pick. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going probably a little further off the radar here. Oh, baby. Austin P. Governors. Wow. Matt Figgers our, our, squad. Yeah, they're going to do the thing this year. They're, they're making the lead eight run, and – it's going to be awesome. Look, Everybody's going to get to know the governors. There is no no finer coach personally in this country than Matt Figure. I spent some time when I was covering another one, another one of these guys. You know, you guys, you got to support. No, you another support guy for team. team Fall. No, he's just like one of the most like easy guys to root for. You want to talk about like an everyman. Matt's one of them. I hope you're right because I love that dude and I hope I hope his team does well. What do we like about Austin P? I mean, the, the way he recruits there, and he's done this since he's – I mean, you could go back to working for Frank Martin and South Carolina and Kansas. You have a bunch of tough, tough kids. And I think that – and, and there will be older guys too, so he's going to have an upperclassman roster. A lot of the guys that are back from last year's team, like I think those older teams that can kind of get in there and punk you, that I'm, I'm all for those teams come March. And I think that's what they've got to where they're going to – somebody's going to end up seeing them as probably a – let's call it a 5-12 matchup. And whoever that five seed is, you do not want to see the governors when uh, they do this selection. So come up on. He does. He, he does. You make a good point. He does have a lot of Frank in him in the way his teams play. You know, Gus Johnson oh. used to refer to those old Frank teams as, as Doberman pinchers. And those, those, these Matt Figure teams kind of play like that too. And I, you know, I think it is the culture. Like I said, I hope you're right. I wish I would have picked them now because I do like the guy. And he probably will be sitting in your chair at this podcast eventually. I assume we'll have him on. I assume he'll hear this. And uh, maybe we can have him on after Underwood. My last pick – oh, my last pick was Nova. That's it, right, for me? One. Yeah, that's it. it. That's it. Very similar. Uh, and we'll get to swap one out halfway through and, and kind of see what happens. 
you have anything else you want to touch on before we call it a day here? Yeah, I just can't wait to see uh, your Bills logo on your Twitter profile and seeing you jump through a table at the Bills game next year. Uh, no, I'll do that regardless. <laughs> I, I, will, I will find it. If they let me get on top of the Winnebago, I will definitely do it. Now, you might have to take me to the hospital after, but I'll do it. I'm right down the street from the stadium so we can make it work. <laughs> All right, Dan, I appreciate you, man. And uh, I guess we'll see you the next time we have you on here. Good, man. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye.